So, Marco, I'm not going to give a whole lot of background on you. We'll kind of let that come out. But obviously, people can tell from your accent that you are not from around here. So, where were you born? I was born and raised in Costa Rica, in Central America. I'm an immigrant, like many of your forebears, probably all of your forebears at one time or another. Um, I came to the U.S., let's just say, twice. Uh, initially, um, I came here as an exchange student, believe it or not, a wonderful American institution by the name of American Field Service um, sort of gave me an opportunity. I was a reasonable student, maybe not the most brilliant one in the, in the bunch, but um, I don't know what, what noise I made that uh, I made the cut. And I ended up being uh, sent to live with a wonderful family outside a little town outside of Youngstown, Ohio. And uh, wonderful people. These people embraced me, um, it were nothing but kind to me. Seems like everybody wanted to feed me something. The ladies, uh, my, my mothers of my classmates. Um, and if I can elaborate a little bit up as to the time, because it is, it's kind of, I was thinking about it today. It is uncanny, but, uncanny, but I, I came here in the school year 1967-68, a momentous uh, period in the history of this country. Those of you with some gray hairs on your head uh, may have been around. Most of you have, did not. But Vietnam War was at its worst. Uh, the racial uh, relations in this country were a shambles. Um, Martin Luther King is assassinated in the spring of 1968. Bobby Kennedy follows not uh, to, um, uh, soon after that, during the campaign of 68. Uh, the Democratic National Convention in Chicago turned violent. It was a time of, of, of uh, turmoil. Um, and I was absorbing uh, everything uh, in front of me. And it literally uh, changed my life. Uh, it gave me a perspective on a people that I was just learning uh, to, I was just meeting, learning the language. And on top of that, something very wonderful happened. Um, I met this beautiful girl um, in my class. And uh, so uh, at the tender age of 18, we all fall in love, and so did I. And that poor thing has been my wife for 45 years and counting. So, uh, but before, uh, before that happened, um, I went back to Costa Rica. I went to get a job. I'm number four in a brood of six kids. My parents uh, were teachers, and there wasn't a whole lot of extra there for, for me to attend uh, school. I did, however, at night. Um, and I began working in a laboratory at the tender age of 18 when I returned. Uh, and I haven't stopped working or being affiliated with a lab ever since. Uh, it's been my passion of these many years. So in three years, and a half later, in 1972, I came back, and this uh, wonderful uh, girl uh, uh, waited, um, and uh, we got married that soon thereafter, and um, I started going to school at night. I worked for a wonderful group of pathologists that taught me a great deal. Uh, in fact, I, I always say that my university was those six years that I spent with those folks, uh, kind, they were my teachers, my mentors, and they sort of ushered me into and encouraged me to pursue graduate studies. I ended up applying to the University of Maryland and came to Baltimore, and I never, never left. Came to Baltimore in 1978, um, right across the street. I started going to school there, also some courses in College Park. Uh, met a whole bunch of uh, wonderful people in the community. Um, and as you mentioned earlier um, uh, to the audience that it is about making friends. And I truly believe that. I always say uh, I'm in the business of making new friends. And out of that, occasionally, I might do a business deal. Uh, but it is a prerequisite. Not... Anyway, so that's, that's where I come from. Um, so um, I, I, I would say that the immigrant community continues to contribute, uh, certainly in the tech world, uh, in the biotech world, in medicine, in the professions across the board, not to mention also you know, the lower echelons uh, where labor uh, is, is, is required to do tasks that are either too tough, uh, too unattractive for uh, other people uh, to, to endure. So anyways. 
So what got you into biotech? Uh, well, I mean, since, uh, uh, as I mentioned, I went into a lab at 18, and I just loved it. Initially, it was the clinical setting, and eventually it was the research setting as I was going, putting myself through school, uh, in graduate school. Um, the idea or the thought that uh, it, you can be uh, influential, you can um, have an original idea and pursue that uh, and publish something that is original, it is absolutely fascinating. And, and when you get into a lab, when you are working for a PI, uh, that opportunity opens up. And to me, that was uh, sort of the impetus for pursuing science. Um, and, you know, we have to uh, acknowledge that uh, we are blessed and we mustn't take this for granted with wonderful universities, wonderful, you know, research institutions, uh, wonderful companies uh, that benefit from inventions, innovations that emanate from our, uh, from our universities. Um, so that's why I... I went into biotech, but you have to remember that, um, and I put it in a different way, uh, because it's, I think it's, it's, it's compelling if I frame it this way. I was three years old uh, when Watson and Crick uh, were awarded the Nobel Prize for describing this beautiful molecule that we know so well today called DNA. So in one lifetime, there, there's been a virtual, a virtual, um, a, a revolution, I would say, in thought, uh, and today, uh, the fruit of biotechnology <clears throat> has been felt throughout um, the clinics. Um, <clears throat> uh, we all get treated with uh, biotechnology, not all, all of us, but uh, uh, many of us, I, I bet you are consumers of some of these products that are, have been generated by, by, by biotechnology. Uh, and new ones in the horizon. Uh, the era of personalized medicine is here. Uh, this may entail cell therapies such as CAR T, immune oncology interventions that are revolutionizing and really changing the way that oncology or certain cancers are treated, particularly so called liquid cancers, lymphomas, and leukemias. Um, a, a gene therapy for a number of maladies that uh, had no other treatments in the past. Um, so, Maybe I can elaborate on that, as I mentioned about uh, founding of the company. Okay, okay, and that's where I was going to go next. So, you know, what what got you into becoming a startup? Obviously, you were you were into biotech, and you you were enjoyed working in the lab, mm -hmm. and you know you were in graduate school. Yeah. And then that path took you to found you know a pretty yeah. impressive company of Paragon Bioservices. How mm -hmm. did that come okay. to be? All right. Well, um, what is it? Uh, necessity is the mother of invention. When I got out of grad school, I had two little babies in tow. Um, and although I wanted to go into the academic um, tracks, um, you know, life is about compromises. But uh, even though you compromise certain ways, I can tell you I have no regrets. I mean, in that sense, uh, it, it took me in a different direction. And that was I needed to protect my kids first and foremost. Uh, so I took a job with the Department of Defense, learned a few other things aside from what I learned in grad, grad school. Um, two years in uh, working for DOD, worked for a little company, quite literally. This is 1991, give or take. Uh, Hopkins um, had become uh, very entrepreneurial. They, uh, the first pharmaceutical company in the region was Nova Pharmaceuticals, the brainchild, uh, uh, actually, I should say, the science based on Dr. Solomon Snyder's um, wonderful work at Hopkins. Uh, that company um, went through various changes. Um, and uh, anyways, today, Isai is a Japanese company that owns some of the assets that they, that they developed. Um, but anyways, these were the early days of biotechnology proper. Genentech and Amgen, uh, that are you know, uh, household names today, they were just getting off the blocks. Um, and uh, to be quite honest with you, I had to look up the term biotechnology. What is this new thing? And after I started looking at it and said, well, this is very exciting and I, I can play some role in this. Initially, I wanted to be a manufacturer and put things in bottles sterilely and develop new formulations of culture media. Those of you that are familiar with, 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 with a biology lab, you know, we do a lot of cell culture um, and, and you need uh, nutrients to maintain those cells in, 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 such, uh, in such cultures. 
but these were the early days. There were no serum-free formulations to speak of, so I started developing new formulations. Soon thereafter, I was, um, uh, so I went and I, uh, a, a flyer came from Hopkins. I answered the call from Hopkins and set up a little lab, a little company, uh, a company of one. Then my wife came to the rescue and was a company of two. And then from then on, it was a few more folks. Um, before long, um, and these are things that you can't put on a, on a business plan because uh, reality uh, shapes your future and you have to be ready for those changes. Today, you know, with uh, mobile devices and, and, and all these things, we take for granted something called the internet. I started a company, we, uh, colleagues of mine that started businesses uh, uh, along those lines, uh, this is before the internet, uh, before email, before any of this stuff. So all of a sudden, you know, the company becomes visible all over, all over the world and uh, started uh, spending more money into uh, branding the company, into um, a, a sales and marketing efforts. Um, and to this day, I can tell you that I'm, no matter uh, how wonderful that idea may be, I think that that is so critical the sales and marketing piece, the branding piece, uh, it, nothing happens. Uh, to me, that's the, the most difficult part of running a business because you know, maybe you have a wonderful idea, but you gotta get it out there and, and try to package it and, and, and present it to prospective clients. Um, so with, with the help of the internet um, and with other, other things that happen along the way, uh, in the mid-90s, uh, Bill Clinton and, and Newt Gingrich got in a dogfight and closed the government. I was totally dependent on, on NIH uh, business and the NCI business at the time. But for a period of about three months, we didn't see a transaction. The phones went dead, nothing happened. No payments, no orders, no nothing. That was a critical lesson uh, learned very fast uh, that now we need to diversify our portfolio and leveraging our ability to be visible through the internet I started marketing to the pharmaceutical companies. Uh, Pfizer Pharmaceuticals has a soft spot in my heart because they were the first uh, pharmaceutical company that took us seriously. Um, I remember they, them coming to tour our facilities and I was really uh, squirming like there was no tomorrow because our lab was you know, very Spartan. Um, but you know, there are good people all over the world. Uh, a fellow's name is Paul Watts uh, who first gave me that opportunity. And we started working for them, stayed with them for years on end. I um, may surprise you, but even pharmaceutical companies, these giant organizations, have needs uh, uh, that, they, that they find it uh, cost effective uh, to send out to people who sort of become specialists at, at certain things. And producing recombinant proteins, pro producing recombinant viruses had become something that we were very good at. Um, and like that, we went to Pfizer, to Lilly, to um, Merck gave us a lot of business over the last yeah, 10 years, uh, producing anywhere between 200 and 250 target proteins for them. But the company kept on, on evolving. Um, it became an all services company, so I gave up all the, all the product uh, lines. And um, so we became part of this uh, sector called uh, CMOs or CDMOs, contract manufacturing organizations, contract development, and manufacturing organizations. And if you look at the health of such companies, their growth is pretty good these days. Uh, they've been very strong over the years. The forecast for growth in that sector is in double digits for many years to come, as there are factors that are helping that. There are the advent of virtual companies that don't have, they may have a technology, but they, they don't, they, um, and venture investors do not wanna let them invest in, in infrastructure. Uh, so somebody's got to do the work and, and companies like, like Paragon is the name of my company come to the rescue. Pharmaceutical companies, if, if you have looked over the last several years, they're in a bit of a, pick, of a pickle. The return on investment in pharma today is, has a, 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 a slope that is going south. Uh, and people are really scratching their heads as to why, why that is. And, and, and it's a real conundrum in a, in a, in a way. Uh, at a time when we have all these marvelous technologies, we can process samples of just about anything. Uh, a, we can uh, sequence genomes of every conceivable bug or creature on Earth. Uh, omics so-called uh, galore. And this is the reality that we're faced with. 
Uh, so that's probably a discussion over a beer, you know, uh, some other time. Uh, but it's fascinating to me. But what, what, what the pharma industry has, has been suffering also, well, not suffering, but by design, they have been consolidating, you know, their operations. And a lot of the R&D or a lot of the innovation, you know, innovation always came from universities. So they're looking deeper and more actively uh, in finding those pearls of wisdom, those, th those pieces of intellectual property at universities. Uh, as the development and the commercialization piece belongs more in the commercial sector. So um, I, uh, I lost track of what else I could tell you about this, but um, forces in the marketplace are always there. And I think that the lesson to me at least was, you know, move with the times, uh, reinvent yourself, uh, align may, may fail, dust yourself off and, 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 and keep, keep moving. Um, so, and allow yourself, because no man is an island, and people are very kind and giving me a lot of credit, way too much credit, uh, I think. Uh, I pride myself in having found a, a cadre, a group of wonderful scientists, engineers, uh, project managers, administrators, uh, legal uh, help among, among many that have come to the rescue, and, and you need to seek, seek those, those sources of support. Uh, I truly believe also that um, in the goodness of people and reach out to folks that are smarter than you are. And uh, all my life, I managed to find sage uh, advice from people who, uh, if you work hard and they see you struggling, um, they will help you. Um, it's like one plus one is two. So, I mean, that's a ton of great advice there. Out of all of that and, and anything else you've been invo uh, involved in, you know, what do you think is the most important part of starting and building and growing a successful company? Hmm. Well, I think um, you have to be, uh, uh, you have to be in tune with, you have to be in a position to answer one key question. And I don't care what kind of business it is. It is why, why am I doing this? Why do I get up in the morning every day? Why am I good at, what am I, not just good, what am I great at? And then, the, but that, uh, the answer to that question is critical because, you know, we spend so much time at work and it has to be something that we're passionate about. If, if we're not, then we need to find something else. See, I get up in the morning happy to go and do what I'm, I need to do today and next week and next month uh, because I love it. Um, and, and I think that that's a, an absolute cri a critical ingredient. I have others. I mean, I think that... that um, Conviction. Um, you have got to have the, I think the, the you, you have to have the conviction that no matter what comes your way, uh, that you're going to surpass that, you're going to conquer that. Uh, it may take some time, it may take friends, it may take whatever it takes, but live with that conviction in your heart. Courage. I mean, I used to have a little dog named Oscar, and uh, Oscar. If anything, he was a little crazy, uh, but, but he was courageous. He was a tiny little thing, about 30 pounds, but that thing what, went after anything that moved, no matter what, to protect my kids, uh, the house. Um, uh, so it is, it is about courage. I mean, it's, it's very lonely sometimes, you know, and when you put your, your, your resources into a business plan, uh, there are a lot of uncertainties, um, and, and, and so, so, so it is about courage. Integrity, I mean, is a given. It's what your mama told you when you were a tiny little boy or girl. You, you, you just can't do certain things. And, and it's, it's, to me, is a, it's a given. Um, and integrity or honesty is not, is, is, is not partial. It's like, like, can't be a little bit pregnant. Um, <laughs> sa same deal. Either you're honest or you're not. Um, and hard work. I mean, that's, <laughs> I, I will assure you, that you will be working a lot, but it can be extremely rewarding. So you mentioned, you know, one of the issues that you had as you were expanding was you put a lot of your customer base in the government and obviously when they shut down. Is there, you know, mm -hmm. beyond the fact that you were forced to diversify, was there other things along your path that you would have done differently, being, you know, having the knowledge that you have now? Well, uh, yes, I mean, I was, um, I was, I, I trained as a scientist. I didn't train as a businessman. 
Um, I, I knew I could get in front of people because I'm comfortable with people. And again, it's about making friends. So I could, I guess I could wear a salesman hat, you know, uh, pretty comfortably. However, I never trained in business. Um, my MBA, I joke about it, but it was a three-day course uh, given to me by the First National Bank of Baltimore or Maryland, which doesn't exist as a name anymore. Uh, I still have the book, uh, but of course, you know, you, you do what you, what you have to do, which is learn as quickly as you can. But in those days, you could throw in, have thrown a set of financial statements upside down. It wouldn't make as much sense as, as right side up. But again, you know, you need to recognize your, 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 your limitations and seek the advice of people who, who, know, the, who know more than you do. So I, would, I wish that I would have, have trained in, not so much in accounting, although you need, need to have a basis of that. Finance, to me, is interesting. Um, the art of, of, of uh, uh, building something that is recognized uh, and either of itself uh, given the odds of getting financed, certainly by venture investors, is less than less than two percent of deals that they finance. So, to to get to that point where, you know, pe people in in that industry um, uh, looks at your at your business plan and and wants to you know um, invest, uh, that in and of itself is a is a uh, is great and it is a compliment in there. So. You are no longer obviously Paragon Bioservices, a very successful company. You're no longer involved in the day to day. You're now right. the assistant vice president of industry alliances at University of Maryland, Baltimore. What made you make that transition? And then, you know, what are what are you involved in now? And what what got you into your current role? Well, um, uh, companies uh, evolve, um, and as you become successful and as you get funded. Um, Sometimes, no, oftentimes, founders, and especially scientist founders, don't fare very well in the longer term, uh, insofar that uh, you, as a company, I mean, I brought here 35, 38 people. Uh, today, there are about 225 people in here. Uh, I could handle, and I knew everybody by name up until about, I don't know, 135, 140 folks. Uh, but then, uh, following the investment, uh, things will change. And there's another, another thing that you need to be conscious of and embrace it for the reasons that I uh, um, uh, mentioned before. Uh, if you want the company to go to a higher, higher uh, sphere in terms of size, and revenues, and, and all these things, um, uh, you, uh, these changes are going to happen. And again, there are people who have done that, grown businesses to you know, very large companies. I never have. So there, there were those limitations. Now, was it easy? And I'm, I'm a human being. I mean, I, I raised this baby. All of a sudden, I have to you know, give it to Abba. Um, even <laughs> as long as the baby uh, is not a baby anymore, is an adolescent or, or a young adult, and is healthy, and is growing, and is getting more cantankerous uh, as a function of time, the company has continued to grow very nicely. Um, so a company of one is a company of 38 when I came here to the ballpark here. It's a company of 225 on our way now. We sign a, uh, a new lease um, for 150,000 square feet of space near BWI Airport because um, the company is a CDMO. Uh, it's a contract manuf development manufacturing organization of vaccines, uh, viral vectors for gene therapy, biologics in general. In order to do that, you need um, uh, fermenters and bar reactors and all these tools uh, of the trade and you need high ceilings like this actually we could have come here <laughs> Jenny you're, you're in trouble here we might have we might have to move you um, but uh, so it has much larger requirements in terms of utilities and and um, uh, auxiliary power and, and, and such so in order to do something for phase three clinical trials and for commercial launch our clients, of course, then we needed to, to make this expansion. But the forecast is, um, I don't, uh, it's in the, in the 350, 400 people by the end of 19. Um, so, and very nice uh, revenues going up and up all the time. So, um, I'm connected, uh, disconnected, um, but I'm, uh, no regrets. Now, so as I was becoming the chairman of, of Paragon, but Abba knows me well, 
is, is not enough for me. I mean, I was always in the thick of things. Um, so since I made all kinds of friends here at the University of Maryland, that's my alma mater uh, as well. Uh, 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 my boss, Jim Hughes, uh, who is also the president of our biopark, um, uh, you know, asked me uh, to consider working for the university. So I'm delighted. I love technology. I love a lot of the PIs. A lot of them I, I, I knew from my days running around here. Um, and uh, it's, I'm doing what I did for the company only in the interest of the university. In this sense, it is about business development. It's about getting their attention and bringing them to the university, not to buy things, but to co-develop things, to do so-called sponsor research, to conduct clinical trials with us, to also a new model that I've been working uh, on, I think I might have mentioned it to you, is uh, what do we do in the future? Uh, the, the, I, the, the more that I got into working with the university, the more I continue to realize that, that, that a lot of the technology will never see the light of day in a, in a practical sense uh, because the rate of collision between people, or pharma companies, biotech companies that can commercialize some of this IP, never make a connection. Because a PI may see a, a pharma person in a conference or they, see, they read their papers, but it's very inefficient. There has to be a better way of doing that. Moreover, you need to bring other sectors to the party. Uh, institutional investors need to get involved. Uh, uh, our government, both Fed um, and, 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 and state government, uh, are also part of this. At the end of the day, we're all in uh, economic development in one form or another. Uh, so invention from the universities, um, it, pharmaceutical companies to sponsor some of that work, government and institutional investors. We, I've been working on creating a model that will optimize that. Actually, to be honest, I'm borrowing heavily from a very nice model that we came across at, uh, in New York, in New York City. Sloan Kettering, um, Rockefeller University, and Well Cornell came together as a source of, of, um, of innovation uh, by having a larger source of ideas or of, of, of IP, then you have a wealth of possibilities there that you would have much less if you were going at it alone. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm working on that model. I think it has legs everywhere that I presented. People like it. Um, but as, it's a work in progress. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So, so really, you know, you're kind of starting the next generation now and helping them. Absolutely, and, and the company formation. You know, the idea of, of this being r real here, you know, the, uh, the grid. Um, you know, this, I don't know, I, there may not even be a space left. Uh, we have uh, great interest and a lot of activity and young companies coming and settling here, also at our biopark. Now we have a little bit of uh, more leverage because the Institute of Genome Sciences is vacating um, one and a half floors at the biopark. But that's good because we can bring more companies to, to, to our neck of the woods. Mm -hmm. oh, that's fantastic. And that goes along exactly with what Startup Rhyme's all about is, mm -hmm. is you know, bringing people together and, and, and getting the, the growth and getting the, the mm -hmm. knowledge and learning from what's happened in the past. So, mm -hmm. you know, we applaud you for, for doing all that. And thanks for coming out tonight. Thank you so much. Um, does anybody have any questions for, for Marco? Yes, sir. Okay, uh, um, <laughs> let, me remember, let me remember, it's a little foggy. Well, um, it, it was critical in my book, I mean, I, I think it's critical for any entrepreneur, is to create a revenue stream um, and, and, and grow that. And as you do that, then you can venture into things that are more risky. I mean, that's one model. There are other models where there is a very interesting technology that you can license from a university and then if it is, if it is that, that good, you will struggle, but you can do it in seeking you know, uh, seed funding. Um, and there are vehicles today that we didn't have when I started doing this. You know, there's Tedco, for example, is a, is a good example. Uh, Ted, Tedco is a good example of that. I don't know if you know about Tedco, it's okay. Um, the university, uh, our universities have created early stage funds uh, on the realization that institutional investors are not going to touch, you know, very early technology. They are very, very risky. Uh, so we have our momentum fund. Uh, if interested, uh, I don't know what branch of, uh, what kind of work you do, but uh, we support young companies of merit 
uh, to come and settle in our right here at the grid or at the bio park. There are, there, there's another fund uh, generated from, actually from the city of Baltimore uh, to seed you know, these young companies. So there's a lot happening today that uh, didn't, didn't occur in, in years past. Uh, but so initially there's no avoiding, you, know, you need money that is non-dilutive uh, from friends, from relatives, uh, from wherever you can get it. Banks, um, unfortunately, I think that we have a couple bankers here, but it's very tough uh, to find a bank that will uh, uh, help you that early on because it's too risky. Um, so uh, things are getting better. Uh, this model will help that insofar that we will bring in institutional investors as well as um, if, uh, pharmaceutical companies as sponsors and philanthropic organizations feeding that development funnel. Uh, but uh, it's working in New York quite nicely, I should say. Um, and, and we hope that we have similar success here in Baltimore. But, but don't be pessimistic. I mean, there are, there are ways. There is a will, there is a way. Yes. One of the things you said is you attributed some of your success to sales and marketing. Absolutely. Uh, when did you know that was the right time for you to engage in those kind of activities? Right, right out of the blocks. Um, you, you have to create a brand. You have to be, you know, describe yourself for what you are. Um, maybe something modest initially, but you know, today with all these wonderful tools that uh, young people, uh, our artists in the room, and there are they're some. I, we were talking about branding, about photography, about you know, um, a, a design. Uh, all these things are, are, it has to be real, of course. And you gotta back it up, because otherwise you, you lose credibility very, very quickly. Bad news travel faster than good news. So, uh, but it is, to me, the hardest part, um, is sales and marketing. Uh, and nothing happens. I don't care how wonderful the idea is. It, in business, it boils down to, no matter what, what it is, how many of these things are you gonna sell? And you gotta promote it. Yeah. Yes, sir. You mentioned you told me the story you talked about your why. Did yeah. you Yes. Did you, did you intertwine that line with the marketing that you were doing before you started? Totally. I think the two go hand in hand, definitely. I mean, in this, let, let me give you an example. This, this is, has happened when the company has become more mature, but it goes along answering that question is why. I mean, I'm, I'm a child of the 60s, so we, we believe in karma and all those things. We're going to change the world. Uh, we invented rock and roll, so, so <laughs> that, that, <laughs> which is true. Um, <laughs> uh, we had funny clothes, though. Um, <laughs> anyways, um, but uh, let me give you an example. Um, and, and, and I instill in my crew, I said, answer that white question. Why are you here anyways? I mean, they look at me a little, a little crazy. I said, don't look at me for a paycheck, number one, because I'm just a guy. I may facilitate things, but it's on you to bring your own sustenance. I mean, if, if I'm gonna believe what you put on that paper, on that resume, but it's on you to deliver, uh, so that. Uh, but, but I always said to them, unless you're really passionate about this, and I ask questions like this, I mean, well, why did you go into science? Um, but as scientists, I mean, I, I do believe in these hokey things that, you know, about changing things, about inventing things, about, you know, better delivery of certain things. Um, I had to answer that in, in that sense, but, I, but, but the, as the company became uh, more uh, deeper in certain things and attracted a lot of very interesting uh, projects, I can tell you uh, one thing that we uh, 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 put in place was to this day is still uh, very productive, is that we will bring um, the head of a company, a biotech company, let's just say, to present their, their, their business plan, their, their science. What is it that they're... What, what area of, 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 uh, of biotechnology are they in and why? And then I will have my entire crew, from the cleaning people to, the, to me, to the project managers, to the scientists of all you know, uh, stripes. And when you hear, for instance, uh, the story of this uh, man, I can give you one example, but there are many like that. 
His name is Ilan Gagnet. He's the CEO of a company called Solid Bio in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Ilan um, Israeli by birth, captain in the Israeli army. Uh, he got out of that. He became a banker, a very successful one, uh, working for JP Morgan in London. And him and his wife begin to have a family. So they have a beautiful little girl, you know, everything is, the child is growing just fine. And then they have a little boy. And then the little boy is not thriving, you know, around two, two and a half, three years of age. Sure enough, the diagnosis is Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So what does Ilan Gagnet do? He hangs up his banking, you know, cleats, um, gathers up money from, he had a lot of contacts in giving his line of work, and creates this company to develop an intervention, uh, a cure for this horrible disease. And we have this man presenting in front of the entire crew. So 150 people at the time, or, or maybe more, all of us, you know, live every day with the knowledge that we need to help this guy and these children, and it's not just one, there are hundreds of thousands of these cases. This, the statistic that was thrown at us, and I forget the numbers, but it was every week that goes by without a cure for this horrible thing, I don't remember how many uh, dozens or hundreds of kids, boys, go into wheelchairs. So that's the why, and then, that's, uh, and then match that to a message to our client base, pharmaceutical companies, biotech companies, that this is the level of passion, the level of dedication, the commitment that we have to you, our clients, uh, in, in doing our work. And I think that uh, it doesn't matter to me what, what field of endeavors you know, we're all involved in, but you need to take care of that client um, and, and, and do it at a, you know, at a level of passion that, 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 that they deserve. Thank you, Marco. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jeff. Thank appreciate you. it. Yeah.